title of my lesson this morning is going to be Keep Moving On. You know, this time of the year seems to bring both gladness and sadness into our lives. It really does. Sadness in the sense that there are those empty chairs that we find at our home from those who have gone on before us, those that we have loved in the past, <coughs> and still do. Matter of fact, there are some of you here this morning who are experiencing for the very first time in your life the loss of a loved one. That empty chair that was not there, that person who was not there on Thanksgiving Day or Christmas Day, how sad it is. So life, this time of the season, brings memories of those people back to you, as they do to Anne and I. We too have experienced the empty chairs in our life, and we experience the empty chairs today from the loss of Anne's mother and my son, Frank. We know what the feeling is like. Our hearts go out to those of you this morning who are experiencing this for the first time. Not only that, you may be discouraged this morning because of something that's happened over the past year. A relationship may have broken up. You may have had some interpersonal relationship issues in your life. You may wake up one morning and find the credit card bill from the Christmas spending overspending is so much until you just don't know how you're going to meet the bills next month. Could be that uh, you are having some type of health issue. But whatever the case this morning, I hope that I'll be able to say something this morning that will help you keep moving on. You know, we've heard some very great messages from Bruce here in the past few months on. How to be happy. What to do when things go wrong in your life. Great messages that's been encouraging to all of us and that are encouraging to me as well. Lord knows, I have needed encouragement this year myself. We all become discouraged at times. Preachers become discouraged. Members become discouraged. Elders become discouraged from things that happen to them in their ministry. We all become discouraged from time to time. And I want to lift you up this morning and help you to keep moving on in spite of what's happened in the past or what the future may bring in 2020. You know, we spend most of our time thinking about the past, things that happened in the past, reminiscing over things that actually we can't do anything about. What's gone is gone. What's happened is happened. What can you do about it? We think about it and try to predict with 100% accuracy the future. And let me tell you, friends, you can't predict 100% of the future. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You need to live in the here and now. What you can change is what you're doing right at this moment. And thank you for being here this morning. You have a great crowd. Thank you very much. You know, I'm going to start this morning my introduction with a little story, a rather long story. But I've shortened my lesson out loud to all of them. I'll get you out of your own time, I promise. But the introduction this morning is for a purpose. And I hope it helps you to keep moving on as you go through this day. The rest of this day and on as you look forward to a new year ahead. 2020. I became discouraged about eight or nine months ago. I really did. I became discouraged and uh, I looked in the mirror one morning. Life was just not going as I had planned. I looked in the mirror one morning and I, you know what I saw? I saw this old man standing there, Hank. <laughs> With a gray hair and beard and twinkle. 
twinkle in his eye, not quite what it used to be. And I began to think to myself, you know, you need to quit preaching. You need to quit teaching. You need to just let some younger guy have that spot. You need to do like we used to do on the farms when we try the old mule. When the mule got too tired and weary to pull the plow, we would let the mule loose and put him out to pasture, so to speak. We'd watch the mule from a far distance as the mule grazed on the horizon. That's kind of the way I saw myself. But some things happened over the course of this year that I want to tell you how God works in your life to lift you back up. I remember the song that Hank sings in our little country band called Don't Let the Old Man In. <laughs> First verse goes like this, Don't Let the Old Man In. You got to leave him alone. It's left up to him, he's knocking on the door. I've known all my life that it's going to come to the end. Stand up and go outside. And don't let the old man in. You know, that's what we do in our lives sometimes. We let the old man and the old woman into our life and it completely shuts us down. We need to realize and God loves us and He cares for us. And in a minute, I'm going to show you how He left me back up. He got me back on my feet again. What's wrong? Maybe I thought about the song. And Bruce asked me one Wednesday night, and so I was preaching for him next Sunday. Well, I had prepared a lesson. The lesson was uh, on the prodigal son from Luke 13. And, uh, during the process of pre preparing for this lesson, it was encouraging to me to learn that God loves me so much. Doesn't make any difference what I've done, what I've been. But what's happened to me in my life, God loves me, and He does. And that's what the story of the prodigal son is all about. And I got several good comments from you people about what a great lesson it was, and how you enjoyed it, and how you took it in your hearts and took it home, and several people left in the context of the uh, my hand out, and it was very encouraging to me. Very encouraging. And the very next Sunday, <clears throat> Joy stopped at the front desk. She said, see ya. She said, I have a package for you. I said, okay, so I looked, and there were four discs. I didn't know who. Who was from? I said, who gave them to me? She said, I don't know. I asked Bruce, I said, did you give me these steps? He said, no. I asked Dorothy, I said, Dorothy, did you give me these steps? She said, no. Well, I, I don't know to this day who gave me those discs, but whoever it was, and if you're here this morning, I want to thank you for those discs. Because they were encouraging to me. It was about heaven. Where do we go when we die? About heaven, about hell, about many other subjects. <coughs> and so, very next Sunday, Bill Cooper came up to me and asked me if I would facilitate the life group. And I said, well, yes, I will. As a matter of fact, I've got these gifts that I want to show you. He said, uh, I'm going to show up this uh, life group session. <coughs> and uh, Bill said, uh, well, who's the problem? I said, I, I'm not for sure. I said, but I'll check it out and see who it's from because I wanted to know, know who, it was, who the gifts were from before I presented it to anybody. Well then, uh, lo and behold, I did some research on the internet, and uh, I found out, I looked on the Disney, it was from Don Blackwell, and uh, who's a minister from the Southeastern Church of Christ over in Southeastern, I mean, yeah, Southeastern uh, Mississippi. And Don, if you're listening to this this morning on video, I want to thank you, brother, for how you've encouraged me this year. Matter of fact, I told Don that I was going to be preaching this morning. You know, I've been going back and forth with email. I told Don that I was going to be preaching this morning. I'm going to mention his name. And I am. I'm going to say a couple of things about Don this morning. When I went up on the internet, I found a note that said, Minister seriously injured in an ATV accident. 
The future is not known for a well-known preacher and evangelist in southern Mississippi. Don Blackwell and his wife Sherry were both injured earlier this month in an all-terrain vehicle accident. <coughs> Don, the executive director of the Gospel Broadcasting Network, and a minister and elder for the South Haven Church of Christ, shattered his T8 erratic vertebrae, which would leave him paralyzed. Sherry suffered less a less severe injury. She will be in a brace for several months. But, as, but has been released from the hospital. The accident happened in Salem, Virginia, where Don was holding a gospel meeting in the area. The couple had gone out for a ride on a four-wheeler when the accident happened. He's a hard worker. He puts himself out there for the cause of the king. I said, wow, this is amazing. And there's a little further research on it. We became so interested in Don. A little further research, and in August, this was back in May that this happened in August, I found a video of him preaching a lesson out of the wheelchair. He's paralyzed now. But I saw him preaching at the Coliseum Pulpit in Seaverville, Tennessee. And Don had preached a message on how things can change so quick in your life. And they came. I was so encouraged by Don. I looked at Don sitting there in a wheelchair, preaching the gospel, and I said to myself, You ought to be ashamed. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You've got all your facilities, you've got your mental capacity, you've got everything it takes to serve the Lord, and here you are, wanting to give up. You want to let the old man in, but here's Don Blackwell, who's paralyzed, preaching from behind the pulpit. Wow, man, that doesn't wake you up. Nothing will. Amen. And then it was shortly thereafter, the very next Sunday, I happened to have the blessing of being involved with three baptisms in the following week, another baptism. So what I'm trying to say is sometimes events discourage us. But when we become discouraged, God will not leave us that way. Other times we become shut down like right because of events that's happened in our life. But because of things that we have done in our life that are hindering us from becoming, becoming who we need to be as Christians. I bet you can say there's no one here today that it's not how things in the past that you're ashamed of. I know I do. Maybe you've done something or said something that still troubles you from the past. It could be something that you wish you had never done. It could be something you wish you had never done. That, you, that you, you wish you had done, but you never did. Whatever the case, you're not by yourself. We're all in the same boat. I want to talk to you about keep moving on when your mind is filled with regret. Believe it or not, the greatest Christian who ever lived had a lot to move on from in his life. <clears throat> he had a past that was full of shame, sorrow, and heartache. But he tells us, how to look forward. How he dealt with a past that was weighted down with guilt so he could look forward to a future that was filled with glory. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 7, verses 14 through 15. We've read this a hundred times before, but I'm going to read it again because it's so important for us to understand and to, <coughs> and to put it in our heart and keep it in our heart. He says we know that the law of sin is sinful, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. He says, I don't understand what I do. <coughs> but what I want, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done things that you wish you hadn't done? <laughs> you just can't seem to pull it off sometimes. <laughs> Here you are as a Christian, you, you 
want to walk with God every day, but then something happens, comes up, and all of a sudden you, you're trapped in sin, and you just, you just say, oh, my God, how did I ever let that happen to me? We're all there. Even though there was a time in Paul's life that was full of heartache, he learned how to deal with his past, and we <coughs> can too. And I want to talk about three ways before the day we the lesson of the year. First of all, on your lesson outline, the first thing that you need to do if you're going to deal with the past is realize that you're never going to be perfect. God tried to live a perfect life one time, just according to the rules and regulations of the law and of the, of the, of the gospel and the law. And, and I, I, I was thinking this was going to get me to heaven, but you know, I found out on the grace of God I can get me to heaven. Amen. I can't be perfect enough to go to heaven. Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 12, look what he said. We was making this very passage of scripture, I think, last week or the week before that. Philippians 3, verse 12 says, Not that I have already obtained all of this, or have I already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ has took hold on me. Paul said he's not obtained all of it. What is it that Paul had not attained? You know, Paul wrote with such spiritual maturity and purity that we might expect he believed that he had, he had conquered all spiritual difficulties and he saw himself as having arrived at his perfection. Yet he assured this was not the case in his life. There was no perfectionism found in the Apostle Paul. That it's common for many Christian leaders to cultivate this idea that they've already attained perfection. That they're already perfect. But without saying the words, they put forth the image of constant triumph that gives the idea that they've already attained and are already perfected. Friends, I gotta tell you. <coughs> I don't care who stands in this pulpit, whether it's me, whether it's Bruce, whether it's you, or who stands here, I'm going to tell you something. We're not perfect. And we're never going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes just like everybody else makes mistakes. You don't have to look very far to find that out if you look at me. <laughs> you know I'm far from perfect. I'm a very perfect individual. You know, Paul was a great minister. You know why he was a great minister? He was a great minister because he confessed his imperfection. That's why he's a great minister. Amen. He simply stated that he had not been made perfect. And that is what all good ministers do. They admit that they are not perfect. They have not been made perfect. People don't want to make it. None of us are perfect. And neither was Paul. Even though this man walked with God, had a dynamic prayer life with one of his people that Jesus might and left, even writing inspired scripture that would go into the Bible, he was not perfect. He just wasn't perfect. He had not obtained all this. He had not obtained perfection. He knew it, he admitted it, that he had not obtained it. There was still plenty of improvement in his Christian life. As much as he had grown in the Lord, there was still a lot of growing in the Lord to do, and we still all still have a lot of growing to do in the Lord. We do. There are two things that we face in life. If we want to move on. Our path. We must avoid living in the past. You know, a lot of us do this thing. Most of our time, we're in the past. As I said earlier. I don't have to tell you why this is true, but I will point to myself, though. <laughs> our present, sometimes we think we've attained all of this. We've done enough, studied enough. We've become satisfied with where we are. We must avoid resting in the present. Anyone could have rested on his laurel, so to speak. Paul could have. He had seen the risen Lord. He had visited heaven. He was known as the world's greatest preacher, missionary, church planner, and soul winner. Yet he still said, I still not what I ought to be. 
May I ask you a question? Are you perfect enough to know that you're not perfect? Put it another way, are you mature enough to realize you're not mature enough? One of the things that Paul made Paul such a great man, but he was more concerned about his character than he was about his reputation. You know there's a big difference in character and reputation. Reputation is what other people think you are. Character is what God knows you are. The reason why Paul is so successful is because he never thought of himself as being successful. Paul was so full of God because he was so empty of himself. You know, I'm convinced that the average person never understands that success is not a destination. It's a never-ending process. One great Christian put it this way, success is not determined by what we are, but rather compared to what we could be and work toward that end. I think that's good. Not measured by what we've done, but rather by what we have done compared to what we could have done. And the first step is moving on in your life. Never be satisfied with where you are and always be determined to make the rest of your life the best of your life. That's what I want. I want to make the rest of my life the best of my life, not the worst of my life. So I'm going to keep point number one. Realize you're never going to be perfect. It's a goal that you strive for because Jesus said in one of the passages of Scripture, Matthew, put the Matthew, you be that for perfect. I am perfect, but he's talking about being perfected in love. You know, you can strive for perfection. It's no one process in your life. It's called sanctification. The sanctification process, that's what we need to strive for. Be, becoming better and better at what we're doing is becoming more like Christ did today. The second thing we need to do is to escape from the past. Philippians 3, verse 13. Paul writes, Brothers, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Paul learned a tremendous lesson. And we need to learn the same lesson that Paul learned. You cannot focus on where you're going until you forget where you've been. I too have to learn that lesson. I'm going to tell you a little story. Don't tell the story, though. I'm going to give more stories to I can recall a time when I was a young man. I often found myself depressed. You know, when you're depressed, it shows. It's hard to cover up. Also, when you're depressed, it's hard to reach out to other people. It just seems like you, a bad transmission in your car. You know how that goes. You know, it just shuts you down and you're locked up and you can't go anywhere. Well, that's the way your life is when you get locked up with a path. And that's the way it was with me. I had so many regrets in my life, things that I'd done wrong, things that I had on my mind. So one morning, I was on the road uh, to Scottsdale, and uh, I was really down on myself that day. And I said, Lord, I'm going to pray and ask you to forgive me for my sin. I ain't ever seen it. I can think of it. I and I said, I'm going to turn them over to you and I'm not going to ask you again. I'll ask you so many times. I'm going to turn it over to you. So I did. Brothers, I want to tell you. I believe that it was that morning that I learned
John 1, verse 9, it says, You confess your sins before men, and he's faithful, and he's just to forgive you your sins, and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I hope you believe that. Young people will walk around this way. He's just and faithful to do that. Willing to do it. Remember, the Christian life is a race. Paul used athletic language in all this passage. The word press on, reaching forward, gold and pride. All are racing terms. And the Christian life is a race. And as you run your race, remember two things. Where you have been is not important, but where you're headed is important. You know, you're never going to sail the ship of life in the seas of the future. Have joy and peace with your anchor stuck in the mud of the past. You can't run forward. You can always look at back. Realize you're never going to be perfect. Escape from your past. Someone told the story of a little boy. He, uh, Listen to a Sunday school teacher tell about Lot's wife and how she looked back and turned it into a pillow of salt. He said, oh, that's nothing. My mother was driving the car to the grocery store yesterday. She looked back and turned it into a telephone book. Friends, he said, not a good thing to look back. Get away from Kevin. Get away from Get away you can correct something you make, a mistake you make, right? Most of the time you can't. Don't so forget about it. Jesus is there to forgive you for sin. So the next point I want to make in the final point is to live your life with a purpose. Philippians 3, verse 13. Paul writes, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, one thing I do, I press on towards the goal. You know, the secret, I believe, of Paul's great life was that he understood the power of concentration. I don't believe any of us who have studied his letters can say that he did not have a purpose in his life. But Paul had a purpose in his life. Beat and shipwreck, you name it. You remember his drug outside the city? Gone almost to death, they thought he was dead. But he gets back up and he goes back into the city and he preaches the gospel. So that's what we need to do when we're knocked down. We need to keep moving on when we're knocked down by the tragedies and things that happen in this life. We need to keep moving on like Paul did. Paul said, I'm going to give my life to one thing. Those two words, one thing, are very important in the Bible. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him how to be saved, Jesus said, one thing you like. One thing you like. When Martha was arguing with Mary over what was really important in her life, she just said to Martha, one thing is needed. David said in Psalms 47, verses 4, one thing I have desired of the Lord, and that I will seek. Now what was that one thing, that one thing that Paul was seeking? He was seeking to press on toward the goal, the high calling of Jesus Christ, and that's what we need to seek. We need to seek that one thing in our life. Paul was like a football player. He sees the goal at the end of the field. He concentrates on reaching that goal by doing the right things and making as few errors as possible. That's why Paul was sure he made sure he made lots of mistakes. No question about it, he did. But he kept the ultimate goal in mind. Going to heaven and being with the Lord. That should be our goal. That should be your goal. That should be my goal. Everything else comes stuck in here. Because this life we sure let you <coughs> One final little story. I'll close the lesson. Uh, Teddy posted no, no, Facebook the other day. This professor came into his class. 
And he told his students, he said, I'm going to uh, give you a surprise test this morning. And he said, uh, he laid the piece of paper on the student's desk. When it came time, he asked him to turn it over. When he turned it over, all he saw was a black dot. A black dot. He said, I want you to write something about that black dot. What do you see? What do you see? He said, I want you to write about what you see. And all the students in the class began to write different things about what they observed. And they come over and said, well, this particular dot is a certain uh, position on the paper and so close to one end and the opposite the other end. I all wrote about everything. He took up the paper and he read the paper back to everybody. He kept around his answer. And uh, every one of them, all the students in the class, made a comment about the black dot on the paper. He said, I'm not going to grade you on this. <clears throat> he said, I just want to teach you a lesson about life. You know, sometimes that's what we are. We always concentrate on the black dot of our life. We don't think about the good things that happen to us, the blessings that we receive, uh, our grandchildren, our family. We think about bad things in life. We concentrate on the black dot too much. I want to ask you, friends, this morning, if you will make a concentrated effort in 2020, Concentrate on the white area around this black dot. And concentrate as little as possible on the white dot. Your life will improve. It'll be better. Key point. I want to make this morning. I'm going to make it from the very beginning. Keep moving on. Find the past and find the perfect imperfection. You keep moving on by number one, realizing you're not going to be perfect. Number two, escape from your past, put the past in the past and forget it and leave it there. And number three, live your life with a purpose. Live your life with a purpose of going to heaven when you die. And you'll be able to keep moving on. I got you to do this this part for all the trouble that I've been. I'd like to close the prayer and do that. I'd like to have a prayer and do that for all the trouble. Heavenly Father, we come to you today realizing that we're not perfect. Like Paul, we struggle with doing the right things and not doing the wrong things. Help us to become more Christ-like every day. Help us to put our past behind us. We realize there's some things we will never be able to forget. However, help us not to let those things dictate our lives. Please help us to learn more from our mistakes. And help us not to repeat them. Also, help us to focus on being who you want us to be. We all have the desire to live in heaven along with our loved ones who have gone on before. And we know, brothers, this is possible. Through Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, and it's through his name that we pray. Amen. In closing, if you don't forget, if you don't remember, I should say, any scripture in 2020, please put this scripture in your heart and keep it. Because it gives you through many trials. You never know what Paul's going to bring us. You don't know what's going to happen. You can become terrible. You don't know. The future is never 100% certain. Paul concludes in Ephesians 6, in Ephesians 6, verse 6 to 13. He says, Time may be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the double scheme. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, 
so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground that you have done everything to stand. That's what we need to do, man. We need to put on the full arm of God. Keep moving on. I hope I'll help somebody here today put your past in the past. And to look forward to a great 2020. And I'd like to say to you right now, Happy New Year in advance. Are you in perfect? Have you never given me life to Christ? Are you willing to leave your past in the past? Are you willing to start a new beginning for your life, to turn your life over to Jesus Christ, of being baptized and testing things for men? I've been willing more than one to baptize you in Jesus Christ of Jesus. That's your head, dog. Why don't you come? Yes. Yeah.